how is the safety compare now versus uh, what it used to be? Is it still, uh, you know, obviously you're still targeting to make it as safe as possible. But how, how does it work? There were some concerns about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the composite safety cell that we designed into the original um, is uh, largely the thinking that we're putting into this new vehicle. Uh, but, you know, the, the team, uh, our team up in Canada and our two teams up in L.A. Um, have had a, a lot of time to uh, see the, the evolution of composites in the automotive and race industry. As a safety cell formula industry uh, and the aircraft industry have, have changed dramatically over the last decade. Uh, and we're including that thinking in, in what we're doing today. But what it allows us to do is have the highest roof crush strength in the industry. Um, you know, the our previous vehicle, we went through all the NHTSA crash tests and we built our own uh, roof crush jigs and had the independent testing done. Um, it had the highest roof crush strength of anything you could drive on the road, um, which is a, a big statement. You know, if you're uh, if you're in a passenger vehicle, um, you know, it, it was not as strong as an Aptera. People see it and they think that the Aptera is small and possibly weak. Uh, that's just not the case. Um, we, uh, we've also built in a, a front impact strategy that's very unique uh, and can really only be executed with a composite type vehicle. Um, you know, great redirection of energy strategies, uh, great crumple zones, um, you know, foam in the nose cone, um, you know, that, uh, and, and some, some interesting materials that we didn't have access to 10 years ago. The impact stuff that you would find in more traditional vehicles that uh, they just work better uh, in a composite vehicle because you can redirect energy so well. Uh, in a steel vehicle, uh, steel likes to deform uh, and it doesn't transmit energy very well unless you have a kind of a boxed beam structure. Uh, in composites, that's not the case. You know, every fiber of a composite carries that energy wherever you want it to go. That's how you design the vehicle. Uh, you know, that's why. You don't see a lot of steel in Formula One cars, right? You see a lot of uh, carbon fiber uh, and uh, and those type of materials. So, you know, our safety strategy is to uh, is to be one of the safest vehicles on the road, uh, and to certainly protect our occupants as well uh, as they can be protected. Uh, certainly far above the federal motor vehicle safety standards that are that are set today. And then uh, recently, people have brought up about the uh, engine nacelles, the wheel pods. The well, how do they fare now versus then? In a uh, say, some jerk driver just kind of doesn't realize how wide the vehicle is the and cuts wheel covers or the in-wheel motor. The actual um, support, the actual yeah. the front wheels. Yeah. yeah, the front wheels, yeah. the whole assembly. Like yeah, if somebody so the, cuts you off and clips you. Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting design element, and it's an aerodynamic element that uh, is kind of a necessity for a very aerodynamic vehicle. Yeah. Um, but because of that, you know, we do have to take special care with how those are made and how those uh, detach in a severe, you know, accident. And for low-speed stuff, how they're very survivable. Uh, they have a five-inch uh, entry and exit angle, so you can hit any kind of speed bump you want or pothole, or, you know, not have any issues. You know, great, uh, great entry angles if you're going up steep hills. Um, but the bottom is uh, is uh, you know soft plastic, so if you if you do uh, curb it on a high curb, or uh, you know you do take a, a side swipe uh, from the tire of another vehicle or something, it's not something that's you know going to wreck your pocketbook. You pay $40 for the new plastic skirt at the bottom of the wheel pant and you just replace it. You know, we had hundreds of thousands of miles of testing on our previous prototypes. And uh, I was just recanting to someone who asked a question online. Um, I can't remember an occasion that we had any severe damage uh, to a wheel pant. You know, we had uh, we had scratches on the bottom of the pants and, you know, sometimes uh, some some scratches on the side from driving too close to bushes and stuff like that. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing that I remember that was uh, that was severe in that regard. So um, once you get in the vehicle, it takes you, you know, a little while to get used to where that wheel is. But there's great lines of sights from the corner of the window uh, to see the top of those wheel pants. And you get used to them very quickly, you know, within a couple of hours where those wheel pants are. Uh, um, a couple of days, you're not fearful of running into stuff. It's, it's just not a thing. Yeah, I liked one of the things you pointed out first go round where you, you kind of push them as far as they would go for extra stability so you could take, you know, faster, harder turns. And then you put it in that race yeah. where it what did it, it won a couple of heats or the whole thing? Um, you know, we uh, Steve and I weren't a part of the company during the X Prize. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, they put it through some pretty harsh durability tests. Uh, you know, they wanted those X Prize uh, contestants to meet all the performance standards that a typical um, uh, vehicle would have. 
Uh, so yeah, they had to do, you know, the, the moose test where there's a moose in the middle of the road and you have to dodge out of the moose test. And, um, you know, it, it, it passed all of those tests with flying colors. Uh, I think there, um, you know, was some, uh, some incidents with all the competitors, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, it did very well and it was very stable. You know, we did skid pad tests, uh, several places, uh, you know, went out to the Arizona desert as a track out. You could you could not get this vehicle to lift an inside wheel, um, no matter how aggressively you turned, um, unless you're, you know, 60 miles an hour turning aggressively and, and pop a curb. Um, you know, it's not something that, uh, you know, is, uh, is unstable. It's very stable, very wide front wheel base. Uh, you know, the, the weight is front biased to the front wheels. Um, you yeah. know, and, uh, something we didn't talk about is why, why three wheels at all. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys are all, uh, familiar with the, with racing, um, and if you you know note uh, small front wheel driven race cars, uh, anytime they're taking an aggressive corner, they're going to lift the inside rear wheel. You don't even get traction from that rear wheel in aggressive turning. Um, you know, so why do you need that fourth wheel? Um, you know, we would say you, you don't need it. Uh, you know, get rid of it. Uh, pinch the uh, turn and radius in the rear. You get rid of all that rear vehicle weight, um, that uh, wheel weight, suspension weight. Uh, you know, platforms for efficiency are, are the way to go. So then, um, are you saying is this a front wheel or rear rear wheel drive? Uh, this vehicle is all wheel drive, uh, okay. but the first vehicles were front wheel drive. Um, you know, and front wheels is where uh, where you where you get you know all your power and traction because that's where the weight is biased to. But uh, this new vehicle, it's great with the in wheel motors because we can uh, we can torque vector between the three different wheels. So one, we can put the power where it's needed. Uh, two, you can assist in steering. So, you know, like tank steering, you speed up one side and slow down the other, you turn the vehicle. Um, you know, that's something that we can do with our, our vectorized uh, uh, torque uh, controls. So I want to ask about, you had said that these um, are technically motorcycles? Yes. And legally. does the, legally yes. so, motorcycles? Uh, in all the two states now, yes, these would be uh, these would be um, classified as motorcycles, and you wouldn't need a motorcycle license. You'd only need a driver's license. Uh, in two states, you would still need a driver's license, but uh, but we're working uh, on trying to. Uh, How about the helmet? You have to wear a helmet then. Uh, and I, kn I know of nowhere that you would need to wear a helmet, but in some states, you would uh, need to have a motorcycle's endorsement on your license, and that's only two states. Uh, right now, um, er everywhere where people live, um, I think is uh, is just fine. I think it's Alaska and, uh, and uh, one of the northeastern states. So I, I don't want you to take this the the wrong way, but um, you know, and I don't mean this in a cynical, um, sinister way. But being categorized as a motorcycle does that allow you to get away with some things? And and the reason I ask is I'm looking here on the website, and it looks like the rear view and side view mirrors are cameras and um is that something you would be able to do i didn't think you could do that yet with a car would you be able to do that in a motorcycle is what i'm saying um you know the uh the the, the get away with part uh is an interesting question uh, we're designing this vehicle to exceed all traditional passenger car motor vehicle safety standards um so we're not trying to skirt anything but it, uh, the motorcycle regs do allow a lot of self-certification, uh, which, uh, which if you're building a four-wheel uh, mass production vehicle would cost you a lot of money uh, and take a lot of time to do. So for a time-to-market perspective, um, you know, we can go to a third-party lab and get testing done in a couple months, whereas an automotive manufacturer that's building a four-wheel vehicle that's intending to sell 10000 a year would have to take six months plus and spend spend a lot of money to spend. So it save us money for sure. Um, on, the, uh, on the side view mirror side, um, the regulations for uh, rear visibility on a motorcycle are a lot less. You know, it's basically you need a mirror that's like, you know, this big uh, <laughs> uh, somewhere. And uh, so we can have any kind of supplement to that we want. So we can have any kind of camera systems or visibility systems we want in addition to that mirror and we will apply for a waiver for that mirror so we don't have to have it at all. But, uh, but if we do, we'll probably, you know, put a mirror in that, uh, that isn't something you maybe use a lot. You know, you, uh, you use your camera systems all the time, but you have that backup manual mirror uh, if you need it. What about uh, insurance? 
Yeah, insurance uh, is is a great one because you know insuring a motorcycle is a lot cheaper than insuring a car. So um, you know they just tell you how much less because you have to contact your insurer, but uh, you know uh, probably less than half of what you would pay for a traditional uh, automobile uh, and insurance. Especially if you have forty dollar wheel skirts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's certainly an issue with Tesla right now is yeah, the availability is. parts and the cost of parts and all of that. I mean, it's very smart to build a vehicle that's like, hey, you know what? So the plastic wheel skirt got scuffed up. I'll go buy a new one. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, you know, with the nine inch uh, body clearance um, and a body that's tucked in behind the wheel pants, um, you know, getting hit with door dings and like running into stuff or running over stuff. Uh, running over things that are in the road and it puncturing your battery pack, that's, that's not a thing for us. You're not going to hit something that's, uh, you know, 14 inches tall that's going to curl up and puncture your battery pack you know, unless you're, you know, <laughs> unless the apocalypse comes and you're, you're running from the zombies. Mm-hmm.